this uh, session is a panel discussion on research-based strategies for spotted wing drosophila management in berry crops. My name is Carolyn Tiesel and I am the industry specialist for berries from the BC Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite you all to introduce yourself by sharing your name and where you are joining us from in the chat. And just make sure that you um, send the message to all panelists and attendees, not just the panelists. Um, you'll have two options in the chat. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am hosting this session today from Vancouver on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Stolo, Squamish, and Coast Salish. We have people joining us from many places today. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of those lands. This session is part of the annual workshop hosted by the BC Agricultural Climate Adaptation Research Network, or ACARN for short, and it is a provincial, provincial network launched in 2017 to improve linkages and collaboration to more effectively address climate adaptation research and extension needs in the BC agriculture sector. This, research, uh, this workshop is a chance to share knowledge on research and tools available to support agriculture climate change adaptation. It is also an opportunity for questions, discussion, and networking. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, this panel includes three short presentations with four presenters, and then we will be leaving plenty of time for questions and discussion. There will be a short question and answer break after each presenter, and then a longer discussion period at the end. We have 90 minutes for the session. After each, um, you can, after each panelist, you can enter your questions into the chat. Um, and you can enter your questions as you think of them, and then we can keep track of them more easily um, if they're in that chat box, or sorry, the, the Q&A box. Um, you can also upvote others' questions by clicking on the thumbs up symbol. If you would like to chat with other attendees, feel free to introduce yourself or add comments in the chat box. We would also like to acknowledge that many of us are working under new work from home conditions. So please bear with us and our speakers if there are any unexpected distractions or interruptions. So now it is my pleasure to, to begin the session uh, with Jen McFarlane. Jen is the research coordinator and a Barry IPM consultant with ES Crop Consult based in the Fraser Valley. In addition to other pest research, she has recently been studying mass trapping as a potential management tool for spotted wing drosophila, and that is what she will be sharing with us today. So I'll pass it over to you, Jen. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon uh, for what I think will be a very engaging session about this challenging pest. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some research that we've been doing in the Fraser Valley, uh, looking into mass trapping as a potential management tool for spotted wing Drosophila. Sorry, my slides are not moving on. Just a second. Uh, so if you were present in the session earlier, you would have uh, learned a little bit of background about spotted wing Drosophila. This pest has been present in British Columbia at least until two th uh, since 2009. And since then, we've seen uh, some pretty devastating effects in some of the crops, particularly if uh, it's left unmanaged. So here are some pictures of impacts that spotted wing Drosophila has in blueberries. The primary way that it's managed at the moment by growers is by chemical sprays. Uh, and these come at a very challenging time for growers uh, when they are also having to battle um, their time constraints due to harvest. So they're trying to get their crop out of the field and manage other um, things that they need to do. And at the same time, they need to get these sprays on to protect their crop from the pest. Mass trapping is a fairly straightforward concept in pest management, with the goal being to capture as many of the target species as possible in order to reduce the population that's present. 
So in order for mass trapping to be successful, we want to have traps with a high capture efficiency. Um, and also it really helps if at some point in the life cycle of the pest, um, the populations are low. Uh, and this means that a larger proportion of the population can be captured in mass traps, having a larger effect on uh, the pest population. The research that we um, have done here in the Fraser Valley has been going on for a couple of years. And our primary goal was to use mass trapping to see if we could reduce the number of sprays or if we could reduce, um, sorry, push back the start date for spraying uh, when the fruit ripens. Also, we were wanting to test mass trapping at a larger scale than it has been tested in other regions. So it has been shown to be successful at smaller scales elsewhere, but we wanted to see here if it would be applicable to a sort of average sized blueberry field in the Fraser Valley, uh, because that is where the need is right now for uh, management tools for this pest. And finally, we wanted to ensure that it was both cost effective and practical for growers to apply. The mass traps were set up in late April. And here we studied 10 different fields of three different varieties of blueberries. So we used two different types of traps. We used um, a yellow trap and a red trap just for comparison. And, but both traps contained the same lure, which is a manufactured by uh, Century. Uh, so we placed 20 mass traps in a line along the hedgerow of the field. This is about five meters or so away from where the blueberries are. Uh, and we uh, collected them weekly to see how many SWD were in each trap. In addition, we took weekly photos of crop stage so that we could uh, track the development of the fruit very closely in each field and um, compare that with the spotted wing Drosophila numbers. We also placed eight, eight traps within the field and these were baited with apple cider vinegar. And these were there to measure the impact of the mass trap area compared with another area in the field. In addition to these traps, we also placed traps with vinegar in other fields in the same region that were not, that did not have the mass trap set up so that we could do a field to field comparison of mass trapped with non mass trapped fields. And finally, we did berry collections where we collected 100 berries from four different areas of the field and we incubated them in these mesh containers and we counted the number of SWD that emerged from them. And this is the most direct measure of impact to the crop itself. So moving on to a few key results that I'll share with you today. As you can imagine, we do have a lot of data um, with this project. So I'm just showing you a snapshot here. So first of all, we did find good numbers of spotted wing Drosophila captured in the mass traps. So even in May and June, when the SWD population is fairly low, we found that 75% of our traps were capturing about one to 10 SWD per trap. So that's pretty good numbers when you add it up week by week. So we do know that our traps are working well in terms of catching lots of SWD. However, when we look at the monitoring trap data, so these are the traps that were baited with apple cider vinegar and were placed in the field to uh, compare the mass trapped versus the non mass trapped areas, as well as with the regional field. So the black line you see on this graph is the regional mean, which were uh, the trap counts from the fields that didn't have mass traps placed. And initially, when you look at this, you, you'll be able to notice that between July 6th and July 13th, there's this quite um, noticeable increase in SWE numbers. And that coincides exactly with the ripening of the fruit, the, the first lot of ripe fruit being seen in the field. And it, it just demonstrates that SWD are very good at tracking the ripening of the fruit. And so they move in very quickly to the field once, that they, once there's something available for them uh, to lay their eggs in. Um, what you might observe from this is that the mass trap fields or three out of four of the blue crop fields that I'm showing here tended to have a higher peak than the regional mean in this first week when we see the increase in numbers. However, the key takeaway that I want you to notice is the size of these error bars. So these are the vertical lines here. 
And these error bars indicate that there is a lot of variation within the field in SWD number. And this is unfortunate because it does make it very difficult to measure the impact of a management tool at the field level. When we see such high variation, so a trap in one area might catch double the number of flies than a trap just a few rows away from it. Um, and that makes it really challenging to study this pest at the field level. Finally, here I'll share with you just a couple of fields as an example of the uh, SWD that emerged from the berry collections that we did. So here is field one, which is also a blue crop field. And what you'll notice here in the blue bars is that a much higher number of SWD emerged from one collection of berries than from the other collections that were done in other areas of the field. So this is 200, over 250 flies emerging from 100 fruit. Um, and we do see when we look at the corresponding trap catches from the same area and the same week for that field, we do also see that there is a, high, a higher pressure of adult flies in that area. However, this doesn't apply to every field. So when we look at this other field, we again see fairly high levels of infestation. So over 100 flies emerging from 100 berries per collection. But when you look at the trap catches for that same field in the same week that the berries were collected, we see fewer than five SWD in each trap. And this indicates it's, it's a local, local evidence of something that has been known in the research community for some time, which is that the traps really aren't a good indicator of the uh, pressure to the crop. Um, and although this is known in the research circles, growers are still relying very heavily on using traps to both indicate when they should start their sprays, as well as the success of their spray program. So we, this does show us that we really need to work hard to figure out a different way of monitoring SWD in real time in the field uh, that growers can use to test the pressure uh, that SWD is putting on their crop. A few takeaways from the mass trapping research that we've done so far. Uh, at the moment, uh, it does seem that mass trapping is not applicable at the scale that we're trying to apply it at. But we do have another year of data collection and uh, we can tweak a few things and see if that makes any difference. I do, however, think that it still has potential at small scale. So small scale or organic growers might um, be able to use these traps effectively uh, in their operations. Um, but primarily the variation that we see in the field makes it very challenging to measure these field level management tools that we want to try. So the variation both in the trap catches as well as what came out of the berries uh, is a key takeaway that we've learned from the past two years of data collection. Finally, just a couple of notes about SWD management. Uh, although alternatives to, to chemicals are being heavily researched, at the moment, uh, growers can still achieve SWD management through the use of chemical sprays. Um, these are effective currently, but they should be done in conjunction with other tools. So um, one key thing that growers can do is ensure that they um, take on really good pruning of their blueberry bushes during the winter months. And this opens up the canopy and uh, reduces the humidity, which is something that SWD love. Also, they can try as hard as they can to adjust their harvest regimes to harvest the fruit as early and often as possible from the field. And as we heard in the talk earlier today, getting the fruit to cold storage as quickly as possible is a very effective way to slow down the development of any SOED eggs that are in that fruit. So it is a really challenging pest to manage and it's important to acknowledge that. Um, but there are some tools that we have and hopefully a lot more in the, on the way with the amount of research that's being done. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone who was involved in this project, as well as the funding, which we have received from the Climate Action Initiative through the FAPE program, the BC Blueberry Council and the LMHIA. And I'll take any quick questions that anyone has. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jen. So we will now answer questions from the audience. So please take a minute to type your questions into the Q&A box. And I will just see what is there. 
we have a few questions coming in. Um, well, one question we have is, were your traps placed within the field as well as along the perimeter as shown in the photo? Uh, yes, so the mass trapping treatment traps, the ones with those sentry lures were placed just along the field perimeter. And a, a pilot project that we did in 2018 showed that uh, when we placed them in the field, they were, they were so effective that we were concerned about drawing flies into the field. So we didn't use those traps within the field to measure the flies because we didn't want to increase the pressure to the crop itself. Great. Uh, another question sort of about the design. What was the size of the field that you were mass trapping in or, or what was the range in sizes and how many traps per acre did you have? Yeah, so the, um, the fields ranged in size from about eight acres up to ooh, the biggest one is probably 40 acres in size, so quite large. Um, and but but every field we we just made the part that we were studying a smaller section. So it was about a hundred meter stretch along the one edge of the field that we studied. Um, and so the mass traps occupied about um, yeah, about 50 meters. And then we had a sort of control section of 50 meters that we placed traps in as well for a comparison. Okay. A few more questions. There's lots coming in here. Uh, for small growers and organic, would exclusion netting be more feasible as it achieves zero tolerance demands? Yes, exclusion netting has been used elsewhere. Uh, if you can afford to put it up, <laughs> it makes great sense. Uh, and it has been used in conjunction with mass trapping. So the two together can work quite well, I think. Um, so yeah, I would say that this mass trapping method is probably cheaper and easier to use than exclusion netting. But I haven't worked directly with exclusion netting, so I can't say for sure. Um, and then it, when using mass trapping, do you think there would be an effect by focusing trapping even earlier in the season than you already have? Yes, um, that is something we're going to try next year. Uh, we thought by putting them up in the early spring, so that was, we put them up in bloom this past season. Um, but this year we plan to put them up in March. So during bud break of blueberries in the Fraser Valley to see if we can really increase the impact that we're having with the mass traps. Can you uh, speak a little bit more about why uh, you used apple cider vinegar as an alternative to the lures that were in the traps? Yeah, um, this may be a regional preference. Apple cider vinegar is what is widely used, well, is used in the Fraser Valley at the moment to measure spotted wing drosophila levels. Um, newer research since we designed it, which was three years ago, uh, has come out and there's probably a couple of different um, baits that we could use out there that might be more effective. Um, what we wanted really was to measure the ambient SWD population. So we, like I said, we didn't want to use those same lures that we're using for the mass traps in case they were in fact too attractive and ended up, if, if we catch such high levels, high numbers of SWD, we just can't measure differences. Um, so we may look into changing our bait for next year or doing some bait comparison. Right, and the lures that you were using were the sentry lures in the yes in the main traps. Yeah. Um, lots of good questions here. Um, what proportion of the trap catch was SWD? Yeah, that's a great question, and it wasn't something that we directly um, counted. We didn't have time, unfortunately, to process all of the non-SWD, but. Um, in the mass traps, and it depended, it actually changed through the season. So when the catchers were lower in May and June, we probably did catch a highish proportion of other insects. Uh, later in the season, when the SWD populations are high, they really just dominate the traps. So when we're catching hundreds of SWD in one trap, it's hard to see if there's anything else. But other Drosophila species are probably the next most common thing that we'll find in the mass traps. And then along that theme, um, is there a risk of, a, of catching beneficial insects in the traps? Yes, there is. <laughs> and, were, and were you seeing many? Um, we did see some, yeah, we certainly caught uh, some pollinators in there. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, like I said, we did put the mass traps up during bloom and I wouldn't say that pollinators were, were as attracted, like we weren't catching them in high numbers, but every now and then we would find a bumblebee or a honeybee in a trap. 
probably predatory flies like surfed flies were also something that did turn up as well as other other flies like just regular house flies and such um but i would say that compared to chemical sprays um we wouldn't be having we as much of an impact with the mass traps on the beneficial population and let's um, let's have one last question here before we move on. So, um, would the effectiveness of mass trapping depend on the amount and type of field border vegetation and on the types of farming happening near the target fields, um, such as berries or versus row crops? Yes. Sorry, was the beginning of that with the success of mass trapping be affected by the border crops? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> question disappeared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, um, does oh, it, yeah. is the trap yeah. catch variation have to do with the right. field? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, if there is Himalayan blackberry in the hedgerow of the field, the, tra the, the pressure in that field of SWD will be much higher. Um, and with the one field we had, had, it was in a more remote setting and it was bordered with a sort of native um, conifer forest and the SOB catches in that field were very low, almost too low to measure any effect. So uh, yes, definitely the surrounding vegetation and if there are raspberry fields nearby, that tends to increase the numbers of SWD. So the surrounding vegetation is very important. Um, yeah, when we see the numbers in the traps. Okay. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, and Thanks. we will now move, move on to our second presentation. You can continue to post questions for any of our presenters in the chat, um, and those can be answered if you, if you check, check back in the, um, the Q&A box. Um, the next presentation is by Dr. Vaughn Walton from Oregon State University. His work focuses on management of key insect pests and horticultural crops with the aim to aid growers to adopt and implement techniques that optimize natural resources, including the environment, biocontrol, and natural chemicals, including volatiles, to manage these insects. So welcome, Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. And um, I'll mostly just talk about work that we did this past season. Um, I'm going to talk about one technique today only. I'll talk a little bit about pesticides towards the end of today as well. And uh, people who have been involved with this work uh, here at Oregon State um, is uh, Dr. Gabriela Tate and uh, Christopher Adams, who's at the Mid-Columbia Research and Extension Center. And so, as Carolyn said, uh, we are making use of natural resources and uh, doing studies on Drosophila uh, to, to better understand how volatiles and natural enemies, uh, hopefully in future as well, we can use those to, to manage these insects. And so, um, part of the work that we did starting in 2017 was to better understand the biology of these insects. And um, one of the uh, people in our lab, uh, Dr. Tate, observed um, uh, when working on Drosophila suzukii that these flies were actually depositing liquid onto the berries as they were laying their eggs. And so one of the ways in which you can measure that is uh, by uh, feeding these flies food grade uh, colorant or a UV colorant. And um, if you light these flies up under these colorant, you can see them real nicely here. Here we have red ones, we have green ones here on the right hand side. If you light the berries up, up that have been um, overposited on, you can see the deposition of those volatiles on the berries. So that was kind of a curious observation. And what we then did is we started looking at the berries themselves to see if those volatiles produced by those flies has any impact on them. So we have four graphs on the right hand side here. And one of our first experiments we did was to wash volatiles off clean fruit and we analyzed the, those volatiles on those fruit as can be seen in this bottom control, the second from the bottom control graph here. If you have flies that are infested with eggs, you can find um, seven really, really important volatiles um, on those berries. Um, these volatiles are all um, fatty acids. And so in the past, 
uh, when people have been looking at uh, volatiles for trapping Drosophila and so on, they've been looking at these highly volatile compounds, including, including some of the compounds that you can find in um, many of these commercial lures that, that's now available. So if you look at these berries infested with eggs, you're then looking at uh, artificially pierced berries. We can find that these volatiles are very, very different. If you dissect the antenna out of the fly and you look at the um, physiological response of that antenna to those volatiles, we can see that for each of these volatiles, there is a very, very clear response um, of the antenna, whether they're males or females, to those volatiles. And as soon as we saw those, we got really excited and we started looking at those volatiles under lab conditions to see if we could change the behavior of the fly. Now, very often when you look at these volatiles, we also realize that plants produce those volatiles and we, that we can start using plant-based materials to produce those volatiles. I'm not sharing any of the results that we did since 2017 with you since we, we don't have uh, time today. But what we eventually ended up doing is we formulated these key volatiles, including other volatiles, into a dispenser that we place in the field. I'll show you what those dispensers look like in the next slide here. So this is what the dispenser looks like. It is the, uh, put at the base of the drip line here, and it is irrigated on a daily basis. And it's that irrigation on a daily basis that activates those volatiles. In our trials in 2017, 18, and 19, uh, we did under controlled conditions uh, work where we actually exposed this volatile right next to fruit to try and see if we're able to pull the uh, damaging insects away from the fruit itself. And we got really, really good results from those. However, the key um, thing that we always need to look at is, does this actually work under open field conditions? And so in 2020, this year, and late last year, we started doing some open field efficacy trials here in the Willamette Valley, also in California, and uh, in other parts of the country and world as well. So what we did here is we took these dispensers, placed them, at the ratio of about 50 pads per acre. We did completely randomized um, replicates. We had 10 replicates, um, uh, ran the experiment over a 21 day period. Total plot size here, 18 acres, about 0.5 acres per plot. And we grouped them in such a way that we had our treatment with our 50 dispensers per um, acre ratio. We had plots directly adjacent to that, about 20 plus feet away from the closest dispenser. And then we had control plots. And we measured on a weekly basis, sometimes two times per week, sometimes three times per week. We'd go into the field, we would collect from every plot a number of berries. We would bring them back to the lab and we would look at infestation over, over those periods. So first example I'll show to you is a low pressure example. And this is from the uh, Willamette Valley um, in the earlier portion of the season. So this trial was run from the 7th of July until um, early in August. So as I said earlier, we have our grower um, standard here. What we had, uh, our grower standard was just a normal pesticide spray regime. Every time a pesticide is applied is indicated by an arrow here. And so in all plots, we would have had a total of four applications of Entrust during that period, more or less one spray of Entrust during every uh, week period. We did that in, the, in, the, in our treatments where we placed our dispensers, in our buffer plots, as well as in the grower standard. We also placed our dispensers early in the season. We know from earlier work that these dispensers can last over a 21 day period. And what we saw overall in the season was that our, when we, in the plots that we played, placed our um, dispensers, we had a significantly lower pest pressure by measurement of damage in the fruit, egg laying in fruit. Now, you'd look at these numbers and you'd say, well, 0 0.015 eggs per berry, that's nothing, that's not decent pressure. 
Let's look at a few other scenarios where we have more um, high pressure. But overall, looking, looking re reasonably good here in this trial. Next trial was done in the Willamette Valley much later. So you look at the dates here. Now we're looking at um, early October. This is after harvest. Ran it for a 14 day period until about the 15th of October. So now we're not looking at 0 0.015 eggs per berry. We're looking in the range of two eggs per berry and then going up to about 10 eggs per berry. And so directly after, and remember here, we're not doing any pesticide applications because this is after harvest. So as soon as we start placing our dispensers, we start seeing a reduction in damage. Overall, in that 14 day period, we found a significant reduction in egg laying levels in those plots. Um, so this is uh, the opposite side of the scale where we're having really, really high pressure and we're seeing both in low pressure as well as in high pressure scenarios, both when you're using pesticide and when you're doing it on your own, you're starting to see uh, differences when you're using um, this technology. Last example that I'd like to show to you here is from a third party. Um, this was done in Blackberries in California, um, where uh, again, you can see relatively high pressure. Here we're looking at anything between five to about 25, maybe about 28 eggs per berry. Really, really high pressure. These are scenarios where growers are um, experiencing extreme pressure. pressure. They're spraying um, sometimes once a week also with pesticides. No effect in the first week, significant effects um, two weeks and then three weeks later where we were showing on average about 70% reduction in egg laying. So I was talking to some of these collaborators in California and what they're mentioning to me is that on average when they're using this methodology together with pesticides that they're, they're gaining about a 40 to 50% uh, reduction in damage in their fruit when they use it in combination with insecticides. So in the next two slides that I'd like to show here, I just wanted to show to you um, the importance of selecting a good pesticide. And so um, let's see here if we, we can get the two slides here. So here we have, um, when we're looking at population structure for spotted wing drosophila, total population, 100% um, of course, we know that about 30% of that population consists out of eggs, 50% larvae, 10 pupae, and then 10 adults. Dependent on what you're spraying, you're going to be getting relatively effective or potentially less effective um, uh, uh, control levels. As an example, with some pesticides, and this is not always the, exactly the same between regions, but in some cases you will find a compound such as Delegate, as an example, where you're getting approximately 40, 45 plus percent control of eggs and larvae in the berry after the eggs have been laid in the berry. If you compare that with a compound like Lanate right at the bottom here, you're getting 96 plus percent of uh, control, curative control of those egg and larval stages. And so really important to select your pesticide if dependent on whether you have damage in your fruit as well. Um, I think I mentioned this once previously when I presented something up in Canada as well. So just as a fun little exercise, I'd like to show you here two scenarios where we modeled insect um, pressure as the season progresses. So we have four uh, graphs here, the top left-hand graph here, and this is thanks to one of our collaborators, Dr. Ferdinand Fogg down at University of California, Santa Barbara, finding that uh, you have general increase in populations and you can see here um, egg laying specifically really, really peaking in late August if you're not doing anything. And we're seeing that in fields very often as fruit get really, really close to harvest. And so what you're trying to do when you're doing your pesticide sprays, as is indicated by this dotted line here, is you're trying to keep those populations down. And what I'm thinking is, is happening is that when we do our gum on its own, as opposed to pesticide and gum, uh, compared to pesticide on its own, we're getting better results when we're combining the two of those. And so this is a technology that is totally clean, it's food grade, 
it's not registered at this stage. We're looking at this with many growers in experimental plots. We're very excited about this. We are learning that this is not a standalone uh, technology. We're learning that this is a technology that can save growers some money as well. And uh, we hope that this could make a difference in growers' lives in future as well. And so I've been working on Drosophila suzukii. This is my 12th year working on it. Um, and we've been funded multiple times over the years. This is our third specialty crops grant that got funded. We've got two grants through organic federal um, in the United States as well. And then many, many other collaborators, whether it's growers, whether it's other scientists, whether it is uh, industry people, um, without those people, we would never have been able to get all this work done. And I think that's it from my side at this stage. Wonderful, thank you, Vaughn. So at this time, we can um, ask some questions of Vaughn. So if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box. Uh, our first question is, could you please provide more details on how you created your synthetic blend of volatiles? For instance, did you keep the exact same ratio for each component, which caused a response, as what you found when you washed off the fruit in your initial identification work? Any chance a super blend could be created by increasing some of the components? That's a complex question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, if you, uh, and I could share a copy of the paper that was published earlier this year by Dr. Tate. Um, what was done is they took the exact same ratio of volatiles by using um, standards that you can buy from the lab. When you're taking those um, volatiles, and you're exposing them to those flies, you're getting that kind of response. And what we're seeing is that when you have that mixture of volatiles, you put fruit right next to that, them, it's highly competitive with fruit. So instead of the insect laying its egg in the fruit itself, it'll go to this medium, it'll spend time on that medium, kind of like mating disruption for codling moth. They spend their time there, they probe there, they don't go to the fruit, that's how we believe that the, the damage is reduced at this stage. So we, we would like to think that this is a super blend, but I don't think it's by all means super. Uh, you, we've seen this year under field conditions, very late in the season, you're, getting, you're, you're not going to be able to use this as a standalone. Um, you're going to still be needing some pesticides late in the season, especially close to harvest, but you can eliminate some pesticides. Thank you. Um, and a similar question about what the SWD are doing on the gum, um, but also if you would consider the gum when combined with an insecticide as a trap and attract and kill strategy. Yeah, um, so there has been a, a postdoc in our lab who specifically just focused on um, the behavior of the insect on the gum itself. And what we saw is that there is um, some uh, feeding activity on the gum itself. There is egg laying activity on the gum itself. Um, they, we, we found large numbers of eggs in the gum in certain conditions and, um, and they're just spending time there. They're in some ways um, arrested is maybe another word to use. That's what uh, Dr. Greg Loeb um, said we should use because they're basically just sitting there instead of going to the fruit itself. Then the, comp the question about insecticide, um, we've looked at a few insecticides, uh, looked at Entrust, um, we've looked at Erythritol, uh, we've looked at uh, several other compounds. We found the best of those would be Entrust, which is kind of in some ways a, a little bit of a disadvantage because we're starting to see uh, insecticidal resistance developing against Entrust. But, if you're using a very, very small quantity of compound together with, of entrust together with the gum, it, it, under lab conditions, we found similar results in terms of keeping berries clean of eggs um, when you're using about one, two thousandth of uh, this, the quantity of entrust that you'd be using as a full cover application. So we're kind of excited about that. And we think that potentially what might be happening is that when you um, 
do a full cover application in the field with a pesticide that some of those residues potentially might be landing on those uh, dispensers and that there is some killing activity going on there. That's off label for insecticide. Um, we, you, you can't tell a grower to go and spray it, but if they're doing a full cover application, you're getting a little bit of residue on there. Potentially there might be a benefit and that's maybe why we're seeing um, that reduction in damage when they're using it in, in um, combination with insecticides itself as well. Great, thank you, Vaughn. I, I had one question for you. Um, you mentioned that um, the density is about 50, um, 50 per acre that you put out. Do you have a sense of the labor or the time required um, yeah, putting them out and um, then changing? That, that's the big worry. You know, we were initially looking at, um, oh, we were thinking 2,000 dispensers an acre, which would have been a ridiculous number. Um, we came up, uh, we did a lot of work on distribution and figured out that 50 per acre is good. And labor could range. Um, I've done uh, applications where I've been able to place 50 dispensers in half an hour. Um, so dependent on what your labor per hour is, it could be as little if you put in benefits and all the other stuff that potentially need to go in. Here in America, we're looking at um, maybe $20 an acre application cost, low, so, low end. And if you have a union, I don't know, persons with benefits and things like that, it could go up to about $36 an acre is my best guess. <laughs> so it ranges. Um, I, uh, I'd like to think that it's 20. Uh, so time-wise about, let's say 20 minutes to an hour, depending on the person putting the applications out. And they last for about 21 days, more or less. Okay, so, that's great. Thanks, I, I should have asked it more in terms of hours instead of cost, given the uh, US and Canadian. Uh, um, so I don't see any other questions in the chat for you, but um, as attendees, if you have further questions for Vaughn, feel free to enter them into the Q&A and uh, they can be answered uh, at any time or we can come back to them at the end. So at this time, we will move on to our third presentation. Um, Paul Abram and Chandra Moffat will be co-presenting. And bear with me will be co-presenting research on the unanticipated establishment of two exotic natural enemies of SWD. Dr. Chandra Moffat is a research scientist in entomology with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Summerland, BC, and her research program centers on the agroecology of insect pests, communities of native and non-native plants, and insects they interact with, and the cropping systems that they, in they impact. Uh, and then following Chandra will be Dr. Paul Abron, who has been a research scientist in entomology at the Agassi Research and Development Center since 2016. And his research program focuses on the biology and behavior of natural enemies of insect pests and the evaluation of their biological control contributions to sustainable pest management. So I'll pass it over to you, Chandra. Wonderful. <clears throat> thanks so much. And thanks to ACARN for inviting us. I hope you can all hear me and see my slides okay. So Dr. Barak did a great job uh, earlier today telling us about how invasive spotted wing drosophila is as a pest. And we know that it very quickly colonized so many new habitats around the world outside of its native range that you can see in the dark red. And so its invaded range in the pink um, is quite extensive and continues to grow. And there's many hypotheses about why species become so invasive. And there's often multiple uh, mechanisms operating together. But one of these hypotheses is called enemy release. And it indicates that uh, species can become invasive, at least in part, due to their escape from highly specialized uh, co-evolved natural enemies. And so when they break free of these uh, specialized natural enemies, this can influence and uh, increase their introduction and spread uh, in novel areas, making them highly invasive. So the rest of our, our talk today, we'll talk about the natural enemies of spotted wing drosophila, both here in North America in the invaded range um, and in Asia, the area of origin. So here in British Columbia, um, researchers have spent a lot of time looking at the natural enemies. And so not just in BC, but other regions of Canada and the US. 
And what we really find are that we have a lot of generalists. So there's many generalist predators like ants, pirate bugs, spiders, earwigs, many different predatory um, insects and arthropods that will attack spotted winged Drosophila, particularly when uh, they're pupating in the soil. There's also generalist parasitoids. And for those of us that work in biological control, parasitoid wasps are, are often the first insects we look to when we're uh, interested in controlling an invasive species with natural enemies. But the parasitoids we have here in BC and throughout most North America are generalists, like this pupil parasitoid, that really parasitize at very low rates and don't have any population level impacts. Or they may not be um, well suited to parasitizing spotted wing because spotted wing has a particularly um, aggressive immune system and rejects the eggs laid. Um, so when we look at predators and parasitoids both, we have a number of species, but these complexes are comprised pretty much of generalists that have very little population level impact. There's also microbial pathogens and the degree to which the, we have specialists and generalist microbial pathogens is an area that uh, Dr. Steve Perlman's lab at UVic is working on um, quite a bit, but I'll focus our talk um, more on the insect natural enemies of spotted wing. So coming back to biological control, the premise of biological control really is predicated on this enemy release hypothesis. And so when we reunite invasive species with their natural enemies, their populations can be regulated. So here we might have spotted wing Drosophila coming into a new area and its populations may fluctuate over time through the growing season and in space. But when we reunite it with a specialized natural enemy or a biocontrol agent, the aim of this would be to regulate populations for invasive pest down below a damage threshold. We would consider this a complete success, you know, if our biocontrol agents can, can really do this and drive populations of the invader down below a damage threshold. But what's more realistic in many systems, and especially in the spotted wing system, is that natural enemies will have some kind of effect on spotted wing populations, but whether or not they can actually drive them below damage thresholds um, would remain to be seen. So I mentioned that we only have generalist natural enemies as far as we know here in North America. But in the area of origin in Asia, Japan, Korea, and China, there's specialized natural enemies of spotted wing Drosophila. So there's a few different parasitoid species, and the two most promising um, are the two most specific, Leptopolina japonica and Gnaspis brasiliensis. And these two parasitoids, they do have pretty severe population level impacts on spotted wing um, in natural environments. And as Hannah mentioned earlier, their role in cultivated systems um, is maybe not so, they maybe don't have quite as much of a, a damaging effect on spotted wing, but in the natural areas outside the crop, um, they do a good job at regulating spotted wing population levels. They're quite specific to fruit flies, uh, or, or vinegar flies, I should say, and they only attack Drosophila species. Leptopolina attacks a few more Drosophila species, and Gnaspis is quite heavily host specific, and it's very close um, to hopefully being approved for release in the United States. So these two parasitoid species have a very similar life history. Um, so the adult females, they can locate uh, spotted wing Drosophila larvae that are already feeding in fresh fruit. The parasitoids then lay their eggs right inside the larva of the developing spotted wing. These infected spotted wing, they can still complete their development. It's really neat and they pupate. But instead of an adult spotted wing Drosophila coming out of that puparium, it's an adult parasitoid. And so that's how their life cycle, life cycle continues and they remove um, spotted wing Drosophila individuals from the population and in some circumstances can have quite a damaging effect. So a project that we've been involved in, I think we're in the third year now, uh, is a development of a classical biocontrol program for spotted wing. And so the prior work that I talked about, about Leptopolina and Gnaspis, that's really been done by a number of colleagues of ours in the United States, um, in Europe and in Asia. But here in, in Canada, to get to the point of being able to release a biological control agent, we need to evaluate the safety or the non-target risk that these two candidate biocontrol agents or parasitoid wasps may pose to native Drosophila species. So many of us may not care so much about native Drosophila species, but they're a very diverse group and they perform a number of ecological roles in terms of recycling organic matter. And when we think about spotted wing Drosophila, it's not just the berry crop, of course, that it infests. But spotted wing are moving actively from the berry crop into the forest and hedgerows into the non-crop environment. And so wherever spotted wing moves, if we bring in their parasitoids, those parasitoids will follow. So the work that we've been doing takes place uh, in Summerland, BC in the Okanagan Valley. That's the little star you see on the map here. 
Um, and in this region, we have a number of very important uh, native fruiting plant species that are host to spotted wing. This is just an example of a few. And so to begin to evaluate the risk to non-target fruit flies, uh, we've set uh, vinegar traps or McPhail traps in cultivated hosts. So here in the Okanagan, that's cherry, as well as a number of species of wild hosts. And from these traps, we can sort them into spotted wing drosophila and then many different uh, individuals and species of these non-target drosophilids. So the practical work on this aspect has really been led by uh, my colleague Mari Robertson, who's done almost all of the identifications and has become quite a drosophila identification expert. So Mari and some students that have worked with her over the last few years have identified that we have at least 18 different species of native drosophila here in the Okanagan and all of these show up in our traps in cherry. And when we look at our traps collected from different native uh, fruit species, we see different compositions of uh, native endemic Drosophila species, um, fewer species associated with particular host plants. But as we move through different non-crop hosts, we um, see the full complement of these native Drosophila species. So this looks really crazy, but this is a summary of our data on the distribution of all of these or many of these native Drosophila species through the season. And so we have this great data set that shows us for our different trap locations, which species of fruit flies are active when and at what relative abundance. So not only have we identified the Drosophila species that could potentially be um, at risk here, but we know where they are, when they're active and how many there are over multiple seasons. So this has set us up really well to be able to do the evaluation of non-target risk to ensure that the parasitoids we would want to introduce are host specific enough to not have any ecological impacts on native drosophilids. So the next steps are actually, uh, we have a number of colonies of these native drosophila species in our quarantine and exposing them to the two parasitoids to determine if they're susceptible. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul and we'll be doing questions at the end. Can everybody hear me? Hopefully. <laughs> yes. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Um, so we had started this project and um, while we were doing some other work on spotted wing drosophila, actually looking for, for viruses and microbial symbionts, um, in 2019, um, several members of our team started observing parasitoids attacking spotted wing drosophila in fresh berries at several sites in the lower mainland of BC. So this is the area more closer to Vancouver. Um, and we thought that's strange. We shouldn't be seeing this because the native parasitoids um, aren't typically found to be attacking uh, fruit flies on fresh fruits. So um, we sent them down to a taxonomic expert who's actually able to identify these tiny little parasitoids that as you can see here are only about two millimeters long. Mm -hmm. And they actually turned out not to be native parasitoids. They turned out to be the two species that were being considered previously for introduction to um, the United States and Europe and eventually Canada for biological control of, of spotted wing drosophila. And not only did we find them, but something that was actually quite shocking is that they were kind of everywhere we looked, um, especially the one species left to Polina japonica we found distributed widely across this lower mainland area of British Columbia, all the way from Vancouver to Hope. Um, and then we even found them um, in a few collections on Vancouver Island while we were at a conference there, back in 2019 when you could have in-person conferences. So our questions for, um, for 2020, because all we really knew is that they were here, we didn't really know anything else. So we wanted to know this year, are they both well-established, both of these species in the lower mainland? Some really basic information like where, when, on what host plants, and in what level is each species attacking spotted wing drosophila. Ultimately, our one-year date is not going to answer this, but ultimately we wanted to know how much potential do these newly arrived parasitoids show um, to contribute to suppressing the pest in natural habitats that serve as sources for crop infestation. We are uh, also looking in crop fields, but I'm not going to show that data today. So we did, we surveyed at a lot of sites. I'm only going to show you data from five sites today, but you can think of these as unmanaged habitats, wild habitats, or experimental farms 
that um, where there's no insecticide sprays. Um, and we normally think of these habitats as places in the landscape where spotted-winged Drosophila is able to reproduce without being managed, but without uh, being the, the target of management. So places like forests at mid and middle, uh, middle and low elevations, community gardens, wetlands, places like that that have wild fruit posts. And um, something that was pretty surprising and I think encouraging from a from, from a biological control point of view is that at all five of these sites, we saw that both species were present consistently. Um, they were present all throughout the season from pretty much the beginning of spotted wing Drosophila until the end when we stopped surveying. And they were killing on aggregate when we add everything up between all the host plants, they were killing between about eight and 18% of all the spotted wing Drosophila that were coming out of the fruit. So for this presumably early stage, um, eight to 18% is actually fairly encouraging and it's a lot higher than most of the other natural enemies that have been studied probably. This is just to quickly show that we, as uh, uh, Dr. Burke showed us earlier, spotted wing is on many different host plants throughout the landscape. Um, something that uh, I was um, quite interested to see is that these parasitoids are now also um, attacking spotted wing in all these different cultivated and non-cultivated host plants across the landscape. So. Um, any plant, any host plant that we sampled spotted wing on extensively, we found at least one of the two parasitoid species on, which I think is really encouraging. So very quickly, what might this mean for spotted wing Drosophila management? Well, we don't know yet, um, but we do know, um, it seems from, from this year's surveys, that now in the lower mainland of BC, we do have a new free, um, in the sense that we don't have to pay any money for it, self-sustaining biological control service that's targeting spotted wing Drosophila in these natural habitats outside of crop fields. Um, if I'm being a, a, a huge optimist, I would say that this could result in declining spotted wing populations at the whole landscape level over the next several years, perhaps. Um, to, to what level that will happen, we, we don't know yet. We don't know if we're gonna have sort of a partial biological con uh, control success or something more spectacular. Um, might it also result, I think my, my sort of more realistic hope potentially for what these parasitoids might do is bring spotted wing populations down enough late in the season and in the spring that the population buildup of the fly is delayed early in the season. And so maybe some of those fruits that are fruiting earlier in the season um, have a better chance of escaping high spotted wing pressure and some of the insecticidal management can sort of hold off until later but we won't be able to justify this unless we see that spotted wing populations start to, um, start to decline and build up later. We have some results showing that parasitism in crop fields is extremely low or even absent, but we never really even expected these parasitoids to control spotted wing within crop fields anyway. The idea again is that they're reducing these source populations in unmanaged habitats. I think a lot of our here where these parasitoids already are in future years, um, one of the questions that I think a lot of groups, including uh, Dr. Carrillo's lab at UBC is gonna be looking at is on the farm and landscape level, are there things that can be done to encourage this free biocontrol service and help these two parasitoids help us? Um, so the take home is now we have two new allies in the battles against spotted wing in British Columbia, but both in terms of sort of their benefits and their risks that uh, like Chandra talked about, um, we need to better understand their impacts. Many of you, especially, especially um, who produce berries, will probably want to know, can we now redistribute these parasitoids to other areas of BC or Canada? Um, the, the, the short answer is no. Uh, just because they're here doesn't mean that they can now suddenly be redistributed without properly knowing uh, about their ecological safety. So uh, we still need to complete the host range testing with native Canadian flies. Um, these parasitoids may spread to other areas on their own naturally, but this isn't inevitable. You know, there's a range of mountains between here and the Okanagan, um, and we don't know how climatic suitability might play an important role here. So in the future, if they're found to be safe and, and, and effective, their migration may need to be assisted. But um, in the meantime, their establishment in the Fraser Valley of BC is kind of this natural experiment that allows us to test predictions that have been generated in the lab by European and uh, United States researchers about what their benefits and risks are gonna be in the field. I wanna thank everybody on the slide. Um, it was kind of a difficult summer to conduct research, but, uh, but uh, we, we still found out a few interesting things. So thanks to everybody here and our funders and everybody for listening. 
Thank you, Chandra and Paul. So we now have some time for questions and let's start with questions that are specific to Paul and Chandra's presentation and then we can open up the discussion for questions with questions to all of the panelists. I see uh, we have one question here about how are you searching for these parasitoids, berry collections and rearing, or are you attempting to collect adult parasitoids directly from the habitat? Do you want me to address that, Chandra? Yeah, okay. Um, we go out and we collect fruit. So we repeatedly sample fruit all the way from uh, when it just starts to ripen until it falls off the plant and declines. We put it in Ziploc containers. Um, this summer it was in our garages because we didn't have access to the lab. And then we count how many spotted wing come out and we count how many parasitoids come out. Um, and there's problems with using that kind of method as a measurement of parasitism, but it's a good rough shot to see um, sort of what species are present and at what relative levels. So now if you collect Himalayan blackberries from anywhere in the lower mainland late in the season and you put them in a container, after about 10 or 14 days, flies will come out. And then 10 to 14 days later, parasitoids will come out. So anybody can do that experiment at home. <laughs> but not if you live in the Okanagan. Or we'd be happy that you not would- Not if you live in the Okanagan. Maybe give us new data. So we, we did this, we followed the same collection method um, as Paul's team here uh, in Summerland. And so we did those fruit collections from cultivated house, from cherries, from many wild hosts. And while we got a plethora of spotted wing and Drosophila melanogaster, we did not get any parasitoids in our region. But also, sorry, to, to address the other part of the question about collecting them directly off berries. Early in the season, I just spent, despite ten, spending tons of time outside looking at fruit, um, you don't normally see them. But late in the season, if you're in like a large unsprayed field of of blackberries or even in a big patch of Himalayan blackberries and you sit and you watch the berries, typically you can see um, the adult parasitoids crawling around and very late in the season, like in September, um, sometimes the numbers of parasitoids reach really spectacular levels in the last two years. But they're very small, so you have to look carefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any additional questions for Chandra and Paul? We have another one. Do you know how many eggs each female can lay? Um, I think that could probably go to um, to any of you who would like to take that one. Is this the parasitoids? Um, that is not specified. Um, okay, but, spotted but wing Vaughn could probably answer, but I think reading from one of his abstracts, it's less than a hundred to more than four hundred <laughs> um, for spotted wing. Is that right, Vaughn? It depends, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you think you've, you've collected a lot of eggs in your study and then someone else comes and says, no, it's four times as many. It's, yeah, it's yeah. just dependent on the host plant. It's very, uh, you know, when you look at blueberries, it's typically lower. Cherries is usually higher. Media is very high. And it's dependent on mm -hmm. temperature as well. And so, you know, if you're looking at 21 degrees centigrade, it's optimal. Lower and higher than that goes lower again. Okay, and it sounds like the question the was actually about the parasitoids. Yeah, <laughs> it's on the order of hundreds. So at any given time, this so this is all based on published estimates from the U.S. groups, which are maybe working with different strains or populations of the parasitoids. So the ones in B.C. we don't know any of this yet, but based on sort of the published literature, um, the parasitoids can hold in their ovaries at one time between one and two hundred eggs. Um, probably more near the upper limit of that. Um, and both, both, both species can parasitize. So probably if they can resynthesize some of those, if you look at their lifetime production, it's in the hundreds of, uh, of offspring. Okay. Yeah. Good. And we've opened up a couple abdomens of them and looked at them under the microscope and there's a lot of eggs in there. Yeah. Good, that's promising. Um, can you speak a little bit more about how the parasitoid wasp behavior works on SWD? So the pupil stage within the fruit only, or are there other stages that they can attack? So they attack the- They prefer the-, the Oh, sorry, Chandra. I Go thought ahead. I this one, sorry. Yeah, they, they parasitize the larval stage of spotted wing when it's in the fresh fruit. And so what's neat is that even though the larva in the fruit is parasitized, the spotted wing pupa still drops from the fruit, but then it's the adult parasitoid that emerges instead of the adult fly. But the, the parasitoid, the life stage that they hit is the larva in the fruit. 
So there's still damage to the fruit. Thank you for clarifying. Um, question for Paul. It looks like you picked Forest and Maple Ridge as one of your survey sites. Is there any particular reason for selecting that area? That's our colleague, the berry entomologist in Agassi, Michelle Franklin's backyard. <laughs> So <laughs> that, that was why. But actually, it was sort of a good test case because most of the other sites and a couple of the other sites are places where I walk my dog. Um, so it was kind of a good test case, though, because they weren't sites that we had traditionally had as survey sites in the past where we knew we would find the peristoids. They were arbitrarily in the sense that they're just places that we live and go um, that were easily accessible in a time where we weren't allowed to drive our fleet trucks or do any remote field work. <laughs> yeah. Great. Are there other SWD management strategies antag antagonistic to the establishment of these new parasitoids? So um, we might be referring to pesticide sprays here or other, other uh, management strategies such as pruning or irrigation or that sort of thing. I can start and then maybe if Paul or Vaughn want to chime in after. What I would say is where we expect the highest impact of the parasitoids to be is really limiting the source populations of spotted wing that move in from the non-crop hosts from the sort of the forest or the hedgerow into the crop row. And so we're not going to get enough suppression of spotted wing from the parasitoids that I think we'd be able to really change management practices in the row right now. And then likewise, what you're doing in the crop row, it might have some impact, but really what we think will happen is the populations of parasitoids will build up and sustain in the non-crop environment. We did, we did some work on Pachycryphoides because that's the only parasitoid that we really have over here. And, and those parasitoids, you know, you're getting two, 3% parasitism, which is terrible. Um, so it's really exciting what you're finding up in, in uh, British Columbia. But Pachycryphoides, and I'm, I'm sure these other parasitoids might have the same behavior, is what's called host feeding um, activity. So, uh, you know, Pachycryphoides typically would host feed, and uh, that would result in increased mortality of the insect, the pest insect itself as well. And we were able to measure the increase in um, mortality because of host feeding as well. And so that number that, that Paul and uh, Chandra was mentioning, that 20% might actually be higher than what was anticipated or what, uh, that's directly measured because you might have that host feeding. And what we saw down here is with drip irrigation as opposed to overhead irrigation, we're getting increased host feeding activity. So you're actually getting a benefit if you're doing drip irrigation as opposed to overhead irrigation, at least down here and on that parasitoid. We're not getting that. It might be totally different for you, for you up in British Columbia. Hey, thank you. That's yeah, these, these uh, larval parasitoids don't host feed, unfortunately. Um, but there certainly could be other impacts that we're not measuring. For example, we know that Leptopelina, especially as it walks over a berry, it has kind of a stabbing behavior where it'll stab multiple times. And even without necessarily killing the larva, it might injure it with the stabbing behavior. Um, Jade, one of our undergraduate students, also did a fascinating experiment this summer where she had the parasitoids walk over substrate, take, took them off, and then put spotted wing on. And it seems as if the leptopelina is depositing a chemical that inhibits oviposition by spotted wing drosophila. So for example, the, through the, what's called these fear effects, the presence of these parasitoids might be causing spotted wing to avoid certain habitats, um, reduce their oviposition, um, and engage in costly behaviors that reduces their populations beyond just what are being, what are being uh, killed by direct reproduction of the parasitoids. So, yeah, when, it, when a specialized natural enemy shows up, the whole landscape changes for a, for, for a pest like this. Um, it's not only being killed, but it's, you know, to anthropomorphize it, it's afraid of being killed. Um, so we're, 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 we're excited to look into those effects more in the coming years, too. It's uh, more complicated than we initially think. That's, that's very interesting. Um, have the parasitoids been released anywhere in North America? Question for Chandra. 
perhaps? I think, so not not in Canada or the U.S. And so where the U.S. is at is they've submitted what they call their, well, we call it a petition for field release, but their, their permit. Um, and they're very close in that regulatory process. We're not quite at the same stage, but Vaughn, maybe you could talk a little bit about Mexico, if that's okay. I'm interested to hear more. Yeah, and uh, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong with uh, species and so on, but I do know they're releasing Gnaspis uh, brasiliensis down in Mexico. And the reason why I know about that is they're uh, using, they're actually importing this gum of ours um, to do experimental work. And they're wanting to see if that could be done in combination with parasitoids. So they're releasing thousands of parasitoids down there um, with, uh, with the gum, sometimes with pesticides to see if they could, they could get a benefit out of that. It, it sounds as if they've got a pretty bad problem down there with, with spotted wing drosophila, but they're doing that to the best of my understanding. I think they might also be releasing Leptopolina. Then in Italy, um, there's some work done on, or in the past been done on Leptopolina releases and that work was very encouraging. Um, we did some work, and I think that was shared late last week um, in, a, in an update. Maybe Hannah shared that as well with some of the releases of uh, Pachycrepoides, uh, the generalist uh, pupil parasitoid. That work was not very good at all. Um, we, the, the work was excellent, but the results was, didn't, that was not encouraging. Okay, thank you for that update. Um, we have uh, more questions here, so um, I'll keep going through them since we still have some time. Um, a question for you, Jen. Um, if the berries are infected by SWD, can we observe symptoms on the leaves or the plant canopies, or is it only the fruit that we are looking at to know that they're infested? Um, it's just the fruit, so uh, the bush won't show any other symptoms apart from the fruit being infested. Uh, and you can tell that the fruit is infested, it'll look very sort of watery if you squeeze it. If it's a blueberry, if you squeeze it, you'll see this juice sort of coming out of a little hole. If it's a raspberry, it'll pretty much fall right off the bush. Um, and when you open it up, you often see the lava wriggling around inside, inside the berry. So um, they're not really easy to see when infestation levels are low, but um, but if you, if you walk carefully through the field and um, get your hands on lots of berries, you should be able to find a few that are infested. Thank you. Um, and we have more questions about parasitoids. So um, do you get parasitoids um, from the larvae that do not drop out of the fruit to pupate? So the larvae that pupate in the fruit? It's a great question. Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't know uh, directly because we collect the fruit before they drop. I will say we did do dropped fruit collections late in the year and we get both um, and actually looking for non-target Drosophila that might get attacked by the parasitoids in the dropped fruit. Unfortunately, we found like three non-targets and none of them were parasitized, but, um, but uh, the um, we don't, the parasitism might change the dropping behavior of the larvae, um, but we, we, haven't, we haven't tested that yet. So um, my, my guess, because so many of them are parasitized sometimes, like sometimes we can get up to in single collections, not averages, but in single collections, we can sometimes have 70% parasitism. And in that case, I would be very surprised if both dropped and fresh fruit didn't have, uh, the, the ones that stayed in the fruit didn't have some parasitism as well. Um, so we did in some of the small soft fruit, they almost inevitably drop off the. We, we did a lot of sentinel traps where we used um, these cups where we had fruit in, and then we would place it out in the field. And uh, one of the biggest problems that we had with those sentinel traps was someone mentioned the fruit becoming watery because we're infesting those fruit with, with spotted wing drosophila, right? We want to see if we're getting parasitism rates. And so usually if we don't change it out, we don't drain that liquid out. It's just a total mess and we don't get any parasitoids um, emerging from those. Um, I don't know, I, it feels to me as if something that's 
what Kent Dane was mentioning as well is that I think that the majority of what they were collecting from their sentinel traps were um, parasitized, parasitized um, larvae that would pupate outside of the fruit. So there That's might what be- That's I find in, in my fruit collections as well, yeah. So there is a behavior change going on and, and you see that with many insects when they're parasitized, they, they start, they, their behavior starts changing significantly and they maybe to find some kind of, I don't know, a place outside of the fruit would be better for, for, um, for survival of the parasitoids. I see unparasitized ones coming out too, and I haven't compared the relative frequency, you know, <laughs> but I think it's an interesting, it's definitely something we've got to look at. Yeah. Okay, still lots to learn about them. Um, another question, and I think this could go to Vaughn or um, Paul. Um, when you were, Paul, you were talking about when the parasitoids walk over the fruit, they leave a scent which instills this fear in, um, <laughs> SWD that might be looking to oviposit there. Um, do you think there's potential to identify that that scent or that volatile? So it has been identified in another, a different Leptopolina species, Leptopolina heteratoma. They've done chemical washes of the bodies of these wasps and applied it to substrates and shown that there's three main compounds that elicit this avoidance behavior of the of the adult. And in, in the other study, it was mostly Drosophila melanogaster, a, a, a different fly. Um, but they did test it on spotwing Drosophila, and it would also avoid ovipositing in places that had been contacted by this other wasp. Um, so of the three compounds, the one that's most well known is one called Iridial Myrmycin, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's, it's known to be a particularly unstable compound. And so I've seen in the literature, some researchers have immediately written it off as not something that could be synthesized and applied. But I do think I'm I'm um, looking to reach out to collaborate with a chemical ecologist um, to revisit this with Leptopolina japonica and Ganaspis and see if there's other compounds um, or if there's clever chemistry that can be done to modify the existing compounds so that they're more stable. Um, because yeah, the obvious thing that comes to mind is could we harness these compounds and apply them to crops as a, as a bioinsecticide? Yeah. So when you look at that, uh, those gums that we're, that I was showing, I didn't share that with you, but um... Originally, when we did our first formulations, um, it would only work for like an hour or two. And then we changed it. Um, we started microencapsulating it. And I don't know if you can microencapsulate um, these compounds, but if you can, potentially you'd have a slow release. And if you can get that. So we, we our encapsulations for um, in, in, in the gums that we placed uh, basically stretched it from just a few hours to about 20 some days. So if you could get that kind of thing, then, then you've got really, you've got an amazing kind of deterrent or something that's released over a lengthy period of time, clean, non-toxic type compound, be amazing. What's also interesting is this iridiomyrmycin is present on the cuticles of ants. Um, and uh, we often see ants in these berry fields as well, so it could be that some that this is sort of a non-specific signal. But um, anyway, there's a lot more work to do there. Vaughn, if you know a really good chemical ecologist, <laughs> there are uh, you you know I'm sure you know most of the people that's worked on on these types of things. But there is a new USDA chemical ecologist up. Um, he was, she was working with Jocelyn Millar and she's a synthesis, she can synthesize compounds as well. She's up at, uh, I think in Wapato now. So it might be a good connection. It's one so, of the Go ahead. So there was a question here about overwintering, um, which is kind of an, an intriguing question to me. Um, uh, one thing that we've learned from Drosophila suzukii overwintering is the big mistake that most of us make is we think that it overwinters in fruit. And um, but uh, years back, when one of a, the postdocs in my lab was was looking at survival, we discovered that these flies do need sugar. If they don't get sugar, they will be dead in two or three days, basically. So they do need to feed on a daily basis. And so the big question is when you've got a coniferous forest, 
where does the sugar come from? Um, and we had a student in our lab um, who was working on this. He published his thesis relatively recently, but that sugar, flies can actually, Drosophila suzukii can survive on sugars that are leached, leached out of decomposing um, plant tissues. So that be leaves, be leaves dropped out of trees. You could find um, very often when we look in the early season, when we collect flies in traps, the very first flies we collect is usually in the surrounding vegetation. And so what his work showed is that they, they can feed on those sugars. That's what's sustaining them from those decomposing. That's one of the things that's sustaining them. It's coming from those decomposing leaves. And so what we're telling our growers, and we, we have the scenario here in the Willamette Valley where you can, uh, where, where you can produce fruit with no uh, tree canopy surrounding. And those are usually the scenarios where you have much, much lower winter populations. And you know you can't tell a person in Canada now you have to start chopping out all forests. That's just not sustainable. But you know if you're selecting a place, um, try and find a place where you don't have the sustained um, vegetation, where you don't have leaves um, providing those sugars for those overwintering flies during the winter period. There's just a curious observation um, that, that uh, one of the students in my lab made a little while back. Yeah, thank you, Vaughn. Um, Vaughn, in your trials with the gum, you know, do you see a 40 to 50% reduction of egg laying earlier in the season? You showed this for August and October only. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so in the earlier portion of the season, it uh, doesn't matter whether it's early or late. And I'm kind of also interested to hear why uh, I see it's Tracy who is asking that question, why she's asking that question. It might be something interesting there, but um, we, we've, we've observed, um, I didn't show the data here with cherries, similar results. Um, so this would be late June, these would be some of the earlier crops. We've also shown it with um, strawberries and that strawberries be, be of the earlier crops in the season. So yes, we do see that, um, that same reduction. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, you've got another, uh, yeah, I don't know. So Tracy's question was, uh, was whether it would help delay the population explosion later in the season if you did it early rather than late. It's not like a pesticide. It's, it's, a, it's a compound that reduces the uh, reproductive potential of the insect. So it's going to happen at some or another stage, but yes, it is delaying it. There was this one um, field where we did um, a trial where the populations eventually did explode and <laughs> there was damage, um, but it's delaying it. So in that scenario, instead of spraying, I think we were eliminating half of the pesticides by using this. So it, it does help, but it's not a standalone. You need an additional mortality factor. Yeah. It's good to emphasize that. Um, uh, we have one question, and I, I believe, if I interpret it correctly, I think it's, um, could the parasitoids have come into Canada on imported fruit from Mexico? Um, Chandra or Paul, would you like to take this one? I can answer that one almost, almost conclusively. Um, the the answer is probably no. Um, we know this because we, we, we sequence the DNA of the well, one gene of the of the parasitoids that we have here in Canada, and it's a different genotype than they have present down in Mexico. Also, um, the climate of Mexico and Canada is very, very different, and this genotype that they have down in Mexico, um, it's called G5. It's found throughout the world, including in Hawaii, for example, in kind of subtropical or tropical regions, um, whereas the G1, which is the one that we have, it's known more from temperate regions in Japan and China. So... Yeah. Um, Hannah Burke's talk earlier today, Dr. Burke's talk did show that there's probably been these repeated introductions of spotted wing, multiple introductions over time based on their genetics. Um, I think the strongest hypothesis for how the parasitoids got here is that out of all those multiple introductions, some of them might have been parasitized larvae and uh, after spotted wing became 
well established, you know, and it it created a foothold for these parasitoids that uh, might have been coming in with with in, with infested fruit um, to 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 get a hold. Um, but there's probably lots of spotted wing incursions into Canada and you know throughout the world that are not that are not noticed because they're on ornamental trees or infested fruit or you could imagine a lot of different pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, as it is getting close to five o'clock here, I think we, and, and we don't have any other questions in the um, Q&A, I will um, take this opportunity to thank our speakers um, and to all of you for joining. I know we may not have had a chance to answer everyone's questions, so I encourage you to log on to today's workshop discussion board on Padlet. The link is in the chat and on the Eventbrite event page and the workshop program.